Okay, so this whole phrase, this whole introduction ends with that cadence in the tonic of F minor. But it's not a standard cadence. The chord before the tonic is not a chord of C major, which would be the dominant, but rather a chord of A flat augmented. So it's not a typical 5 1, but on the other hand, when the augmented triad is a 3 augmented, that is the result of a move that we keep encountering over and over again, substituting the 6th for the 5th in the chord of dominant. And sure, we have only seen it in major mode when that creates a chord of minor 3, but it's the same move here, only that we're in the minor mode, and in the minor mode, the 6th that substituted is the flat 6th, so that's how the chord of 3 augmented emerges as a chord with a dominant function in a minor key. I would normally write this as 5 sub 6, even 5 sub flat 6. Here we do have the problem that the substitution itself is happening on the bass. So maybe this is a little crazy, this would be a, a, five, a chord of 5 of C major in second inversion with the bass on G, but with that substitution that makes it a bass on A flat. That would create the cipher 5 sub 6, 6, 4. Or we can just go ahead and accept the A flat chord itself augmented as 3 augmented, understanding that that's how this is an otherwise normal cadence from dominant to tonic. The point either way is that we have a dominant chord that includes an A flat. And since the tonic also includes an A flat, we have a full cadence in F minor where both chords include an A flat. And that is kind of appropriate because the whole progression, this whole introduction, it all has A flat in every chord. There's an ostinato on that A flat. Those trumpets and those horns just keep getting at the A flat. So I found that very interesting. This is the opening of Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony. Some people call this the fate theme. Tchaikovsky's fall. And the symphony as a whole ends triumphantly, so people say that Tchaikovsky wins the battle against fate in the fourth symphony. As many of you would know, the sixth symphony ends rather in complete defeat. Well, this is where it all starts with the fate theme of the fourth symphony, which happens to have A flat all over the place. And I'm wondering how the chords build the whole progression always under an A flat. Welcome to episode eight of first side analysis. Around that A flat, the first phrase delineates a full chord of tonic, F minor. And then there's that scale that eventually lands on the E natural, the leading tone. And that's also when the trumpets come in with the A flat, which sounds quite harsh, quite shocking. E natural is the leading tone really epitomizes the dominant function and then the A flat is the third degree which kind of epitomizes tonic function so there's that clashing quality here it's both dominant and tonic at the same time and of course that's also what happens in that cadence at the end that we were talking about technically we don't really have a constant interval of a major third but rather a diminished fourth which sounds the same but because of the context is much more dissonant so, would this also be a 5 sub 6? Well, that makes sense in principle, uh, but we gotta realize that there's only two notes here. So, if we read it as 5 sub 6, we're saying that there is an implied C, that this is a rootless 5 sub 6. And yeah, maybe, but also maybe not. I'm not fully convinced. So let's look at other options. So that major third slash diminished fourth could be the top of a minor chord, minor triad that would be C sharp minor. And no, that's clearly not what the counterpoint is implying here. So it's not C sharp minor. What about the other possibility? What if this is not a rootless chord, but rather a fifthless chord? And the E is the root, so this would be E major. That would be a little surprising because E major has no business in F minor. But let's see, this is what it would sound like. Wow, that's interesting. It sounds very convincing. I don't know what you guys thought, but E major fits well. So this would be E major. That's the major chord of the leading tone. Yeah, that's crazy. Now, playing the progression in the keyboard, I realized 
This is a very famous progression in music theory. This is two triads, minor and major, that share the same third. So, wow, okay, this is a whole can of worms. This would be an instance of common third harmony. There's a lot of theory, developed mainly by Russian theorists in the 20th century, looking at Russian post-tonal music, for example, uh, Prokofiev, even Rachmaninoff, and they devoted a lot of research to how chords may substitute each other by common third relationships. Now, that theory doesn't really deal with chord-to-chord -chord progressions. It's not that they're theorizing about the progression from one to the other, but rather how they appear instead of each other. Here we have a case of a chord-to-chord -chord common third progression, and I wouldn't say that this is a substitute of tonic. This still sounds very much like dominant. It still wants to go back to F minor. So it would rather be a kind of alteration of a chord of seven. We saw an alteration of seven in Wagner's Tannhäuser, but this would be a different one. On the other hand, Neo-Riemannian theory also deals with this progression that tends to happen as a progression, tends to happen a lot in Hollywood music, for example. I don't want to get into all that detail because the chord is incomplete after all. This is still only two notes. This is not fully F minor going to E major. Let's keep going and see what the context is in the rest of the piece. Maybe that will give us a guideline to how to approach this move. Next up we have finally a complete chord. So there's two voices here, three total with the A flat. And they make up the chord of D diminished. So if we're still in F, this would be a diminished version of 6. And if we're saying that we're coming from a dominant, this then would be a kind of deceptive cadence. So 6 is not naturally diminished in the minor scale, but it is this chord if you're using the melodic scale. Also in that analysis of Mozart's Fantasia, we also saw how these chords and these progressions resulting from a melodic minor were theorized as early as the 1700s with Rameau, if not before. So we could take this as a deceptive cadence in F minor, especially if we were willing to complete the previous chord with a C in the bass. So I'm not really bothered by adding a bass. If you look at it, the whole texture of the passage doesn't really have any voice devoted to the bass. So it is conceivable that the bass is uh, missing or implied. And as we were saying, that previous incomplete chord could very well be a 5 sub 6 in F minor. We also saw that, at least to my ears, completing it with an E major triad uh, works just as well, if not better. Um, but in that case, the deceptive cadence doesn't quite work as much. So we would have to look at that D diminished chord as actually belonging to some other key, like pointing away from the F minor. So what else can D diminish be? Well, any diminished chord is, in principle, a leading tone. So in this case, D is a leading tone that would be in the key of E flat. And in the key of E flat, the chord of E major would, oh, it would be the Neapolitan. So we would have the Neapolitan. Again, I think we would have to provide a bass because the Neapolitan usually goes in first inversion. But if we do provide that bass and then complete that D diminished into a full dominant chord, B flat, and we have a perfectly okay progression. And even so it makes sense on paper, I don't think that it's too convincing as an interpretation of this particular piece. That may be because I'm very familiar with the piece, I've listened to it many times, and maybe that familiarity is telling me that we're not going to E-flat, I can't really tell. But the point is that at this point in the symphony, all of these incomplete insinuations and all that ambiguity that they create is part of what makes up the music. But let me see, there's still another role for that D diminished. D diminished is 2 in the key of C, which is the key of the dominant. So it's not too crazy to think that that's where we're pointing. And it would be the chord of 2, so in principle a subdominant. But I want to keep an open mind because 2, especially when we have incomplete chords and not enough voices for the full harmony and so on, 2 is also part of 7-7. Seven, seven. In that case, the D diminished chord would be completed by a B natural. And yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense when you play it like that. So much sense that I think this one would be the one I would go with if I had to choose.
In that case, we can even try to interpret the chord of E major in C as part of that emphasis, the chain of chords that are pointing to the C. And in fact, the E major chord does have the B, which is the leading tone, the main key that points towards the C. And that G sharp, you could say it's actually an A flat that is pointing down in connection with that B, it, it points down to the G that's part of the C. This actually is the progression that we saw in Wagner. So the B and the A flat form a diminished seventh that points in, and the E is anticipating the third of the resolution chord. In Wagner, this was easier to accept because the anticipation was happening in an inner voice. It's trickier when you have it in the bass, but as I've been saying, I'm okay with providing a missing bass to this progression here in the symphony. So in that case, what we would have is this. So wow, this is pretty interesting and pretty cool already. We found, we kind of stumbled upon an explanation or an interpretation of this light move, that move between a minor and a major triads that share the same third. And this is not one of the usual explanations that have been attempted. This is a slide move happening in a different setting from other slide moves. Anyway, the texture seems to continue to complete itself. Okay, this is a chord of D flat major and then with a seventh. So the C flat there uh, is, a, is an added seventh. So in general, this is D flat seven. D flat 7 coming from a D diminished 7, which I'm going to take as the B diminished 7th, B natural, as the emphasis to C. And then what's happening here, we've also seen one of the notes of the diminished 7th chord is dropping by semitone, and that makes the chord a full dominant. Uh, we saw this in the chaos movement by Haydn, and it's actually, it kind of does confirm that we're on our way to C because then you see that motion D going through the flat onto the C. This is very common, and it is in fact what happens in the Haydn movement. So the diminished chord, one of the notes drops by semitone that makes a major seven chord a dominant chord, but it's not really a dominant chord, it's actually a German. So the D flat is pointing down to the C, and the B natural is pointing up. The common enharmonicism that we've seen several times too between a dominant seventh chord and a German chord. So he writes it as C flat, of course, but the function is that, it, that we're pointing to C. So I am now expecting the resolution of that German, but let's see, let's talk about that resolution, because the German, first of all, we don't have a bass here, so the apparent inversion of this chord is not the usual inversion for a German. Usually the German has the, the note that's pointing down towards the dominant, so in this case that would be the D flat that points down to C. Usually that's the note that's in the bass. And then when that resolves, then we have the C in the bass. The German usually resolves to the cadential 164. And that means in this case that we're going to have a 164, but if we're missing the bass, what we're going to have is a chord of F that's not a cadential chord. And in effect, what is a German, so in principle an emphasis to the dominant, is going to resolve directly to tonic. So interesting, this is something that does happen in, this, in the 19th century. The German uh, kind of emancipates from the dominant and starts being a chord that points to tonic on its own without the intervening dominant. And this is a case of this. So very cool, we have a full progression in F already. So started in F, then a couple of emphasis towards C, the diminished chord, and then the German, and that German resolves directly to the tonic. It's by no means a conclusive arrival to tonic closing a phrase or anything, but we are back to the chord of tonic, so let's see what's up next. Oh, okay, so we have a full explicit slide move. This is a complete chord of E major, coming from a complete chord of F minor. I don't know if you noticed, I was trying to stay away from having to deal with the whole theory around the slide move. But here it is, an explicit slide move. So I'm gonna have to do a separate video with all this stuff about the slide move. So make sure to join me, it's really, really interesting. For the moment, this kind of confirms the reading that I had chosen before, 
The chord is E major rather than a 5 sub 6. And what happens after? Oh look, this also confirms the reading that we've been following. So we have a full B diminished chord. If you remember, I surmised that that D diminished chord was actually part of a complete chord of B diminished. Well, here we have the full B diminished 7. And again, it is followed by a German. So cool, this confirms all that we've done so far. Let's see, what happens to that German this time? Well, this time we're not going to the chord of tonic. This is another chord of E major. So, well, all these chords, the E major chord, the B diminished chord, and the German are emphasis to the dominant, to C. So we're reaching another chord of E major, which presumably is also functioning as one of those emphasis to C. And this is the point where we reach the final cadence, that 5 sub 6 going to 1, and that 5 sub 6 is the dominant that we had been pointing towards and emphasizing all along. Not exactly a chord of C, as we saw at the beginning, but it's a substitute for what would have been a normal dominant chord of C. So we have a full analysis of the complete fate theme of Tchaikovsky's 4, where Tchaikovsky managed to chain together a whole lot of harmonic content always pounding on that A-flat, the ostinato A-flat of the theme. So leave your comments or alternative readings or questions below and keep an eye out for that video where I'll delve a little bit into the slide move. Until then, thanks so much. This is First Side Analysis. I'll see you next time.